Good evening, everybody. It's John here from Tutor to You, welcoming you along to the second of our revision blasts aimed at giving you some help and support for your very soon to be upcoming exams. Uh, tonight, we're concentrating on coasts and hazards, the options. Uh, so, welcome to you. If you've not joined us before, we've got about 30 minutes or so, maybe a little bit longer, that are fast paced activities and some exam advice. We would love to see your responses to the questions that we've got to ask using the chat window. Uh, it's not me delivering the questions, I'm just on the decks tonight. Uh, I'm joined by Alice on the right-hand side of the screen, and I've got yeah. Catherine in the middle. Good evening, both. Hiya. Good evening. Hiya. Now, just before we get started, a quick reminder to everybody, if you're not aware, we also have our Grade Booster 2023 digital course available for you to enrol upon. That has lots and lots of videos and uh, documents and digital games for you to have a go at uh, to help you with your revision. So if you haven't seen that before, check that one out. That might You might find that really, really useful and valuable. I think... We might be ready to, oh, a quick reminder, the PowerPoint we're using tonight will be available for you to download pretty much as soon as we've finished this live stream, so you can look through those questions in your own time, if you so wish. And of course, if you're watching the recording of this, if you're watching this on replay, you as well can uh, take your time over some of the questions. But I think we're ready now. Shall we get cracking? Yeah, let's do that. Here we go. Okay, so welcome everybody and thank you for that introduction, John. So to, I'm going to want to start with a quick reminder that uh, giving you the overview of paper one. Okay, and if you joined us on Tuesday, you'll know a little bit about this. Uh, but here we go. So the quick reminder that paper one has three sections and everyone studies water and carbon uh, cycles in that section A. Um, and those are the questions if you look for two six markers and a 20 that we'll all face for that topic for AQA A-level. Now, section B looks really similar if you think about the question types. Um, you're presented with all those same question types in the same order. Um, as you know, we're going to be talking about the most popular landscape system option today, which is coasts. Uh, so if you have studied hot deserts or glacial environments, this session isn't for you, but there are two other recorded revision blasts for each of those topics. So I would go onto the tutor to you uh, YouTube channel and try to find your specific landscape systems uh, video to have a, have a watch of and, and have a go at those activities. So we're gonna be focusing on coasts and that's gonna be uh, section B for most of us here. But the, if we look at section C, that's slightly different. We're also gonna be touching on hazards. So if I can have the next slide, please. So section C, it's worth remembering, carries more marks than section A and section B. And that's because if you look at the question types we'll be facing, there'll be a four mark question again, one six mark question, and then two nine mark questions in sequence, followed by that all important 20 mark essay question. So this, this section C, um, Again, we're focusing on hazards, not ecosystems under stress. We've got other revision videos for ecosystems under stress. But that hazards uh, section carries quite a lot of marks. So you're going to have to think about how much time you spend on that. Uh, if the overall length of the exam is two and a half hours, that's about uh, 1.25 minutes uh, per mark. So you're going to need to think about spending more time on section C on your hazards topic. OK, so um, a reminder that the physical paper is next Wednesday, the 17th of May in the morning. Um, and this is what we're here to support you with today. Worth thinking about if that is the first um, exam that you've actually sat so that your, it's your first exam next Wednesday. You might need to just really think carefully about reading the questions carefully, particularly those essay questions, potentially bugging those questions by boxing the command word, underlining the key phrases you need to respond to, and then glancing back at the overall question as you start to plan your essay answers. So using that first two or three minutes of a 25 minute stretch on an essay to make a bulleted plan is going to be a really, really good way to start 
on, on if that is your first um, exam to just kind of steady yourself and think, yeah, I know how to approach this question. Of course, don't cross out your plan if you don't quite get it all down in time because the examiner can look at the plan, uh, but do leave time for a considered conclusion for those 20 markers using the language of the question. So if it's a to what extent question, you might decide that something is true for example, to a large extent because of something, something, or this is true to a lesser extent and then explain. So using that uh, language of the questions is important. Now, Catherine, should we start to talk about coasts? Yeah, that'd be wonderful. So um, when I was talking about water and carbon cycles on our Tuesday session, um, I was talking about the systems approach and that systems approach is something that runs right the way through A-level geography specifications. Um, really important that you are able to understand what's going on in coasts as a system with inputs, flows and transfers, stores and outputs. And what happens on a coastline is that you've got processes that are in action and they create landforms. And the landforms combine to produce a distinctive landscape. One of the things in this specification that can sometimes throw students a little bit is when they ask questions about landscapes. And you might be thinking like, oh, no, I learned about landforms, but that's fine. Landforms combine to form a distinctive landscape. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so one of the topics that doesn't seem to have come up very much for a little while, so I thought was worth mentioning, um, looking at today, is the idea of high and low energy coastlines. And this is also really good to look at because then that brings in a wide range of different landforms and the landscapes. So when we're talking about high energy coastlines, we're talking about coastlines with rocky cliffs, headlands, and those are in areas where you've got very powerful waves. So that's what the high energy bit is about, is that powerful pounding of the coastline by those waves. Low energy coastlines are very different. They're sheltered. They have landscapes that are formed mainly by depositional landforms. So when we're thinking about a high energy coastline, they are particularly dynamic. When we're using the term dynamic in geography, we're thinking about something that is changing over maybe um, quite small time scales. So there's lots of change happening. Powerful waves are eroding landforms such as cliffs, stacks, and they will change and the resulting landscape will change. Now, when we're thinking about these processes, a really important thing to do as well is to think about the um, think about the sequence of events that's happening there. So we've got this dynamic environment change happening over time, and it's happening in a particular sequence. When we come to the low energy coastlines, they tend to be more stable. They're dominated by deposition but they will still change over time. But often that change is going to happen over a much longer time scale. But sometimes there could be something very dynamic happen. A big storm breaking through the neck of a spit could mean that there could be a very rapid and dramatic change, even if we're talking about a lower energy coastline with those depositional features. So, here are some of my holiday picks and you can see here um, some of the high energy coastlines from the UK but please remember that when you are looking at um, coasts at A level you are studying the whole world. GCSE, if you did the AQA GCSE geography you will have looked at UK landscapes but when we get to A level the world is our oyster. You can use examples that are from all over the place. So there's a few examples here. We've got Flamborough Head from up in Yorkshire. The Pinnacles I've put down there because all of you will know about Old Harry in Swanage and if you're looking one way from where I was stood taking out a picture you can see Old Harry and you look the other way and you can see the pinnacles so you can see those beautiful stacks there in that chalk coastline and then very famous for its high energy coastline is the north cornwall coast any of you that are heading down this summer to boardmasters down in newquay um you know and, and different events like that will know about the high energy of those waves that are battering the north cornwall coast so we get these very dynamic landscapes which are being created by this high energy 
then we go to the low energy and we've got places like Blackpool. And that's a photograph I took there of Blackpool, the sun setting over the beach. Very, very extensive beach there. Lots of depositions happened in that sheltered area. And you can also see the great big beach there at Tenby in Wales. Important to um, make sure we're thinking about our lovely Welsh beaches as well. And then you've got a picture there of Spoon Head Spit. Make sure you have a good understanding of how these landforms form. And like I say, the sequences, because you could easily get a four mark question come up on a whole variety of landforms. And spits are forming where we've got this opportunity for deposition we've got the shelter there and particularly that side of spoon head spit you can see there's also a mud flat there which is another depositional landform and you can also see the marram grass there on the salt marsh so let's have a little think then about um let's have a little think about the high and low energy coast. So there's about to be some text appear up on the screen. OK, so there are five mistakes in this text. So what I'd like you to do is to have a little um, look at this. And then if you think something that's um, you spot something that's wrong, can you put in the chat box, put um, the correct answer and then not and then what the wrong answer is. So you might say something, not something. So let's see if you can come up with some ideas of which ones there are the bits that are wrong. Right, brilliant. Lots of good ideas coming there about the gentle waves. What should we have? Yes, brilliant. Anthony suggesting there a different word instead. And then keep reading through. What else can we see that could be um, wrong there? Right, excellent. Yeah, so we got people picking up there about the low energy not being dominated um, by erosion as well. Excellent. Right. Oh, fantastic. Right. OK, so let's reveal first of all which words were wrong. OK, so those are the words that were incorrect. And let's have a little look now at what could be right. But... Um, I looked at this activity with my amazing um, year 13 students from King Alf's um, earlier today, and some of them did say to me that they would put a different one for the last one. So we've got here about the high energy coastlines with the powerful waves or the strong waves um, there. So well done for that one. Um, then high energy coastlines, particularly dynamic. That's correct. Um, we've got lower energy coastlines are sheltered. And the, so that's where they have depositional landforms. And then it says they're more stable because they're dominated by deposition. And then the last one here, an example of a low energy coastline is Blackpool. It's on the Irish Sea coast and has a very short fetch. Um, you could, um, some of my students said they, because it said short beach, they changed it to long beach because i showed you that photograph of that big extensive beach but remember what's going on at blackpool there is that whereas we've got in the north cornwall coastline we've got that long fetch we've got that long distance of um wind blowing over the waves giving them a lot of energy and we don't have that in coastlines like Blackpool. It's on the Irish Sea coast. It's only got a very short fetch and so that's one of the reasons why we end up with a low energy coastline there. So another area which often um, is one that students um, can get a bit confused about is when we think about sea level change. And you need to know about coastlines of submergence and coastlines of emergence. Coastlines become submerged when we've got the sea level rising in relation to the land. So you will have learnt about eustatic sea level change, where we've got ice that is in ice caps and glaciers, which is based on the land. And when that melts and that goes into the sea and we see the sea level rising. And of course, that can also happen through thermal expansion. And when the sea rises up, what can happen is an area like you can see in the picture there. That's at Foy in Cornwall. And that would have had river valleys in that area. But what has happened over a very long time is that the sea level has risen and the seawater has flooded back up those valleys and has filled them up, forming a rear. 
Now, if this happened in a glaciated area, then you would have U-shaped valleys and you would have this same idea of the sea flooding back up them and you would have fjords forming. And sometimes you may have a piece of coastline like in Croatia, where there's a whole series of valleys running parallel to each other in the past. And then that is flooded, leading to the formation of a Dalmatian coast. So those are all to do with eustatic change there and looking at coastlines of submergence. So when we look at coastlines of emergence, we are normally looking at the idea of isostatic change. So the weight of the ice sheets and the glaciation was on those landscapes for a very long time, putting pressure on the land. And then the ice melted. And what happened because the ice melted is the land was able to start to very slowly rise up. And that can form features such as raised beaches and marine platforms. Scotland on its west coast is very well known for this. I was really lucky to go to uh, White Park Bay in Northern Ireland. And this is an area which is very near the Giant's Causeway. And there's been all sorts of changes happened there in the past. And the landscape has been shaped by glacial processes, by processes after the glacial melting, such as isostatic change. You've had tectonic activity there as well. And if you look closely at that picture, you can see that there's an emergent coastline. You can see where the coast used to be. And um, that is raised up above where the fields are now and where the beaches are now. So we've got submergent coastlines that have been submerged by the sea level rise. We've got emergent coastline where the coastline has risen up because of that isostatic change. So let's have a little look at... Um, some stepping stones. And what you're going to do is you're going to have a little think about what parts may be missing from a chain of analysis that is going to appear any moment now. So imagine you've got a question that's come up and you are needing to think about the formation of a raised beach. This could be maybe a four mark question and you are explaining about it or it could be maybe you've got a six mark question where you're using the figure and your own knowledge and it's showing you a landscape where we've got a raised beach. It, this could come up in several formats. So we've already got there a statement about Scotland being covered in ice during the last ice age. Once the ice melted, melted isostatic rebound began. We've then got two gaps and then our final statement there, raised beaches formed as a result. So what could we pop in those gaps to branch that first statement to that final statement? Can you pop in there? Right, I can see brilliance, yeah. Yeah, so Anisha's do, um, made a really good point there about the land rising up, fantastic. Yeah. Well done, James. That's looking fantastic as well. Yeah. Great stuff. Right. OK, so let's reveal now what we've got in the first box. So first of all, we've got Scotland being covered by the ice and the ice melting and isostatic rebound beginning. Then the ice is gone. So the land isn't being pressed down by that weight anymore. It starts to rise. And then... Yeah, Ryan's put some very good points there as well. The coastline emerges from the sea in areas such as the west co um, coast of Scotland, and that formed raised beaches. So remember what I was saying earlier about this idea with coasts of sequence. Really important when you're answering questions that you're thinking about the sequence that is happening over time. So I'm now going to hand back to Alice. Thank you, Catherine. Oh, 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 just a reminder here, of course, that we have some case studies that we need to know key facts and figures about. So we've got need some place knowledge, some key coastal environments. And this is the first one. So a coastline um, at a local scale is one thing that we do need to know about. But what exactly do we need to know? So we need to understand how specific coastal processes 
are acting on that landscape and generating particular landscape outcomes. But the other thing we need to know about is the challenges represented in its sustainable management. So thinking about people, therefore, how are people using this place? Um, how must the environment be protected to uh, yeah, conserve that, that, coastal, that special coastal environment whilst allowing people to access it, potentially have, have jobs there um, and enjoy that green space? So those are the two elements of that particular case study. And think about where you've studied. Do you know some killer key facts and figures that could be uh, included in different types of question relating to your local scale case study? Oh, and we have the second case study, of course, here. So yes, you will no doubt be talking about a number of environments across the UK, but we need to know at least one case study in some detail that is outside the UK. So a contrasting coastal landscape beyond the UK. Now, some people have done the Sundarbans. I noticed that was in the chat. Other people might have studied Odisha, perhaps in uh, India. Other people, you've done all sorts. So it doesn't really matter what your case study is, as long as you've got some key facts and figures about it in relation to, in particular, how it presents risks and opportunities for human occupation and development. So some links there to what we're looking at in terms of sustainable management, but just thinking about risks as well there in terms of these perhaps two examples that I gave you of very low lying land. Um, and then we also need to know about can we evaluate human responses uh, of resilience, mitigation, and adaptation in that place? So I guess that's hinting at the idea of climate change and how is climate change potentially sea level rise, as we said, uh, eustatic global sea level rise, how's that gonna impact on the landscape and therefore the people that live there and what's their response to it? Okay, so those are the two case studies that you need to know about. And we just wanted to remind you that that's a key part of your revision. But let's have a look at a practice question for coasts. Here's a, a sort of typical six mark question where you've got, um, so this would be the second six mark question where you've got a figure, but we've also got that phrase and your own knowledge. So using figure three and your own knowledge, assess the view that sea level rise is the most important factor in the development of this landscape. Okay, so if we just have a look at unpicking that question then, using figure three in your own knowledge. So we know what we've got to draw upon, not just that figure, we are gonna go beyond that figure. And that's what that and your own knowledge phrase means. Um, but what's the focus of the question? So the focus of the question is assessing, so that's our command word, the view that sea level rise is the most important factor in the development of this landscape. So if we're thinking about factors that might have shaped this landscape, can you type some into the chat for me now? What do you think are going to be some of the key factors or the key variables that have really shaped the landscape in this context? context and of course in an exam what you'd start to do is really examine that photograph quite carefully you might be jotting around that photograph remember the insert is your insert um, when you get into the exam but often for this style of question you've actually got the photo on the paper so you can write directly underneath it and this is an aerial view so view from above or coastline within Aesu Bay which is a rear coastline in Japan. So we've got the context of it. What have we got coming up in terms of factors in the chat? So some people have talked about eustatic change. I think that's going to be really relevant here. Um, rate of erosion. Yeah, clearly erosion had a part to play here, perhaps historically. Um, yeah, lots of people talking about eustatic change, which is excellent. What might we be jotting around the photograph? What can you see in that photograph that you might be wanting to comment on because we know we've got to use that figure so we're going to need to comment on what we can see and and kind of what that means in terms of factors that might have shaped this landscape so people suggesting it's it's a dalmatian coast in in, in shape i think it's slightly um i think i'd be definitely talking about rears here which is also coming up in the chat uh, not a delta no um, how do we not know it's a delta? Well, if you look at the shading, it's probably easier if you d get to download the slides. But if you look at the shading of it, um, this is mountainous. OK, so, I mean, if we think about how we sort of go about answering this and the factors we might discuss, 
um, and, and using that figure, we definitely comment on the classic dendritic shape of the rear. So we can see the pattern of historic river valleys, which are now flooded or mostly submerged, leaving only the hilltops visible. Um, from that, we can perhaps infer that the rivers drained from the from the top left hand side of the landscape shown in the image to the bottom right hand side. Now, we don't have any information here about orientation of the photograph. Otherwise, we could if we saw that north was the top of the photograph, we could talk about the, the rivers historically running from the northwest to the southeast. Um, clearly, you'd be commenting on the low lying land that was created by the action of rivers eroding the landscape creating those sort of mini drainage basins, which we can see in the image. And, and that underlying landscape was really important to create this, the idea of low lying land, which was sloping down to the sea, which is then flooded. You might also talk about the precipitation, the climate, the local climate in this place that resulted in the erosional action of rivers um, that facilitated this inundation. Um, geology, Perhaps there is not a lot to talk about here. All the valleys seem to run in the same direction. So perhaps there's homogeneous geology here or rock type. So we might discuss a number of factors in turn in our answer. And then perhaps going back to conclude that the impact of eustatic or global sea level rise is going to be one of the most important factors here, given the, the level of, of flooding in the image. So but this, as Catherine was saying, is to do with the increase in the volume of water in the oceans, uh, most likely as a result of a decline in ice on the land um, due to warming temperatures globally. So thinking about that, that um, rise in, uh, global rise in sea level, about 12 metres at the end of the last ice age, around 25,000 years ago. So we, we'd need to assess what we think on balance is the dominant factor, um, and that might well be a conclusion that eustatic sea level rise is key. Okay, so some really good answers there, and thank you for helping me out with that one. We need to switch to hazards now. We've bought off, bitten off a lot, a lot to uh, get through tonight. Um, so let's have a think about hazards, um, which of course is section three, the bigger section, and let's just think about what even is a hazard. So, a hazard is clearly an event that poses a threat to people and/or property. Um, and as all good geographers know, we don't really talk now in terms of natural hazards uh, because we have a better understanding of the way that human processes um, can cause, uh, they can minimise or enhance the effects of events like earthquakes, storms and wildfires. Um, and also this idea that our perception of the risk a hazard poses can vary and may influence the degree to which a population plans for a particular event. Um, clearly, wealth of a country or region is also influential in terms of how rapidly a population can respond to a hazard event or kind of uh, go about planning and equipping the emergency services, even educating the public ahead of an emergency a, a hazard event. So absolutely, people's um, perception and people's response to hazards does vary around the world. Now, there are a couple of models we need to know about in relation to hazards. So if I could have the next slide, please. Here we have the park model of human responses to hazards. So this is one of the two we need to know about. Now, this chart um, presents the three key phases that follow a hazard event. So we've got relief, so the emergency relief. Then we've got rehabilitation and the phase of reconstruction, which are presented in that order, as uh, the park model says, this is the sequence of events that takes place after a significant hazard, which has impacted, as we can see from the y-axis of that graph, the quality of life. So these phases mark the period of time over which quality of life uh, is likely to decline, um, and it allows us to compare different events and consider the extent of the change in the quality of life, as I said, and the length of the period of time that a population is impacted. It's worth remembering that just like any model in geography, it's a simplification of real life. Uh, and while it helps us to understand what typically happens in a place post-hazard, uh, we should also remember it has some limitations. So does anyone want to put a limitation of the park model in the chat for me. 
what what are the problems we talked about the value in terms of being able to compare different hazard events but anyone want to talk about a limitation for the part model okay doesn't take into account level of development okay no actual time scale it's just a generalized sequence yeah yeah um yeah and and the idea perhaps coming across in the chat that um a multi-hazardous place may not swing back round to where they started from so those of you that have studied perhaps Haiti, for example, will look at the sequence of hazards that have happened to that country in quick succession. And this idea that actually quality of life returns to where it was before might be not quite right for some in some context. But they're using the idea of, of, I suppose, dynamic equilibrium. OK, so well done on those answers about limitations. We are now moving on to looking at earth structure and internal energy, which is, of course, uh, where we need to start when we're thinking about um, volcanic and seismic events, Catherine. Okay, so when we're looking at the earth structure, I just wanted to mention this so that you can have a little bit of a think about the terminology you're using. So when we're thinking about the earth, sometimes people say, oh yeah, you know, it's got the crust, the mantle and the core. But when we're thinking about what's happening with plates, it is more accurate to think about the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. And you can see those marks on the diagram. So we've got the lithosphere at the top there, that more rigid layer and the asthenosphere where it is still solid, but it can be a solid that can flow. And so we need to be thinking about um, when we're talking about these different areas, having um, these in mind. And of course, a lot of what's going on with the um, earth is to do with this energy and this heat that we have in the core of the earth. So we've got the interior of the earth that is hot. That's partly because um, it's still hot from when the earth was formed. It's also partly because of radioactive decay of elements that are within the earth. And also when we have got movement of material within the earth, then there is going to be denser material sinking. There's going to be some heat being um, generated by the friction there. So this is our starting point when we're thinking about the tectonic processes of the earth. Now, you need to know your plate margins, just make sure you know them. And you've got there just a little overview of some of those basic terms that are used. But what you need to be really aware of is that any of these different aspects could come up, particularly as a four mark question. We've had in the past, um, I think there was a question that asked about rift valleys forming. So if you hadn't really had a good look at what's going on at different plate margins, you would be stuck. Constructive margins are where the plates are moving apart, of course, and they are associated with seismicity and volcanicity. Um, you need to remember that you can have the plates moving apart where we have got oceans and they, there will be ocean ridges that form, but also you can have continental plates that are splitting apart, like in the case of the African Rift Valley. So make sure you have a little read up on those. Now, destructive plate boundaries, I know that term drives the geologists absolutely crazy because there are actually different situations going to be occurring, whether we have got a oceanic plate and a continental plate meeting or two continental plates or two oceanic plates. So we tend to get at a destructive plate boundary where we have got the um, oceanic plates and a continental plate, we are going to have um, seismicity and volcanicity. And we've got that subduction happening, which is why we've got the volcanicity. We can also get young fold mountains forming, such as where we have the Nazca plate and the South American plate, where we've got one moving under the other and we get the um, fold mountains forming, which creates the Andes. But we also get sea trenches in those locations. However, we might also get sea trenches where we have got um, two oceanic plates meeting and we often get island arcs where we have two um, oceanic plates meeting, for example, the Caribbean. 
We also have places where a continental plate is meeting a continental plate. And the one everyone tends to know about for this is when you are looking at the formation of the Himalayas, where you have the two continental plates which are pushing together. And then what's happened is that the land has risen up and formed the Himalaya mountains. And then we have the conservative plate boundaries plates moving alongside each other. There's no subduction here. So we don't get volcanicity. We get seismicity here. And the plates may be moving alongside each other in opposite directions, or they may be moving in the same direction, but at different speeds. Now, that doesn't explain for us all of the different um, volcanoes and earthquakes we have around the world, because we also have places like the wonderful Hawaiian Islands. And this is thought to be caused by magma plumes, which are well in the asthenosphere. And that then burns a hole in the crust, a hot spot there with a the magma rising through the lithosphere to create a volcano. I've written a thought to happen there because there's um, some argument that's going on amongst geologists now. And this is one of the reasons why I love this topic and keep reading up on it because um, we don't really know. We don't 100% know what's going on down there. So those of you going off to do things like earth science degrees, it's fantastic because people all the time are hypothesizing about what could be happening and trying to find evidence to support their views. So it is thought that Hawaiian islands have been formed because there's a magma plume causing a hot spot and the, a volcano would form, but then the plate will move over the hot spot and away from it becoming extinct and a new volcano will start to form. And that is why you have a series of islands that make up the Hawaiian chain. Okay, Over right, we've got a it. quick, yeah, thank you, thank you. We, we've got a quick uh, true fol false activity here now. So I've got uh, four questions for you. I want you to put into the chat whether you think the statements are true or false. So let's have a look at the first one. The park model uses a systems approach to explore how people respond to a hazard event. Read that again. The park model uses a systems approach to explore how people respond to a hazard event. Oh, now quite a few people are saying false. There's just the odd one saying true. Let's have a look at the answer. OK, so true, true in the sense that the park model assumes that movement of the quality of life back to where it started from or even an improvement on it, um, rather than sort of sticking with the with the knock that's happened to the quality of life and it sort of hanging below that line. So it's the idea of a sort of steady state where uh, quality of life clearly takes a knock and then it rebounds over time through those three phases. So those of you that said true, that was how we would argue it. OK, let's have it the second one. Models such as the park model can be used to predict how people will respond to future hazard events. Models such as the park model can be used to predict how people will respond to future hazard events. What do you think? So again, we've got a little bit of a split here. I'd say almost a 50-50 split, Catherine. Um, let's have a look at the answer for that one then. Ah, now that one is false because essentially the park model uh, we use to kind of compare previous events and looking at the kind of the time scale that is used uh, that, that, that people uh, describe the impact happening over. So it's not really about predicting specifically, it's more about looking back at historic events and thinking about perhaps how dramatically impacted. It might, it might inform people's planning, uh, but it won't really help us predict how individuals or governments will react. OK, the park model allows us to compare the responses to different hazard events. So the park model allows us to compare the responses to different hazard events. True or false? What do you think? Ah, oh, we've got a little bit more consistency here. I think the audience is going true. Let's have a look. Yep, this is true. This is sort of the purpose of the park model, allowing us to look at the how severe the uh, 
impact on quality of life is, how long a time period it takes before we reach that um, rehabilitation and uh, rebuilding stage. Um, and, and it let, lets us compare different reactions to different hazard events, um, perhaps in different contexts. So um, in highly developed economies versus uh, less developed economies as well. And this is our last one, true or false. Insurance is one way of sharing hazard risk across a society. Insurance is one way of sharing hazard risk across a society. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, there's loads of people going true on this one. I believe it is the right statement yet. Yeah, it is a true statement. Um, absolutely. If we think about something like uh, flooding in this country, um, what, what we're doing is we're all insuring our homes. And then when, uh, uh, if, if, if you like, insurers call it an act of God occurs, some of those acts of God are actually covered by insurance. And so those people who've had their houses flooded, they, they're recompensed uh, you know, for the loss of their home, the loss of their property, but the whole country in a sense has paid for it. So it's a form of risk sharing. Okay, over to you, Catherine. Thank you. Um, so really good that people are having good discussion in the comments there and talking about, um, you know, but is it a system? What is it? Isn't it? And there's some really good discussion going on there. Fantastic stuff. So well done to all of you. Now, you need to know with hazards, I think someone said just now on the chat, is hazards is really interesting, but it all also can be a bit of a pain. And it's really interesting, but you need to know a lot of examples. And examples are not as big as case studies. Um, case studies are something that you'll have spent, you know, several lessons and extended amount of time studying. But you do need to know a lot of examples for the hazards topic. You need to know an example of a recent seismic event, a recent volcanic event, two contrasting events for tropical storms and a recent wildfire. And that means you need to know about the event the impacts of it and human responses. However, I would suggest it is a good idea to have your really good knowledge of those examples, but then also keep an ear out and an eye out for other events that have happened. So I was lucky enough to, um, in Easter 20. 22 to go to Hawaii's Big Island and take the first picture that's on there that says danger, extreme fire hazard. Um, they are really worried about wildfires on Hawaii. This Easter, not so glamorous, but it was fabulous, went to the North York Moors and you can see on the sign there that picture of a the flame. They are also very concerned about wildfires. If you know some good examples, but you also have some other general examples that you're aware of, you're going to be able to put a lot more richness into your answers if you're doing a 20 mark answer. And thinking about this idea that, um, you know, so many parts of the world are now concerned about wildfires, I just think that is really, really significant. So make sure you know your examples really well, but if you know a bit more, it is not going to hurt at all. So we're going to have a little look at some data now. And so let's have a little look at our data in the data lab. So what we've got here is um, some of you might have used a fab resource that's been put together by the tutor to you team um, to look at some questions uh, that are good practice questions for this year. And this resource comes from one of them. And I don't know how well you can see it, but the first one says that it is showing uh, 1981 to 2010 observed trend in forest fire danger. And then the second one says 2071 to um, 2100 versus 1961 to 1990 projected change in forest fire danger. So what I want you to do now is think about this figure. And the question that I'm asking you here is to assess the usefulness of this figure. When you are looking at figures in the exam, you might get asked about the figure to analyze it and you can talk about the patterns and trends you can see, but you also can get marked by thinking how useful is the figure. So it says assess the usefulness of this figure for comparing the observed forest fire danger across Europe to the predicted danger. Can you tell me um, what do you think here? Can we have maybe a point um, from each of you? What would you say? What is good about this data to be able to study that area and what might be a limitation? 
So let's see some ideas now in the chats. So what is useful about this figure and what maybe is a limitation of it? Right, really important point. A student has just said in the text there about being colorblind. That's actually really important because there are lots of people out there that are colorblind. And you need to check with your teacher, with your exams officer about um, how you can be supported with that. Um, I have done that for some students in my school and they are allowed to have people to describe to them the colours. So please, if you're colourblind, please talk to your exams officer and find out what can be done to support you. OK, so we've got some very good points there um, saying about um, it's not very clear sometimes the boundaries between the colours. Um, we've got some points there as well about um, ideas about seasonality and things like that. So let's reveal the answers that I came up with. So one of the things that I spotted, if you look at the brown, you can see that on one of the maps, that brown is showing greater than two. And on the other map, it's showing greater than 200. So that could be quite misleading because you might be thinking the colours show the same thing on each of the maps, but it doesn't. However, something that is quite useful is you can see if the same areas on each map are experiencing rapid change. So you can use the colours to look at that rate of change, but you have to be careful to appreciate that we have got those different scales. So well done to those of you um, that came up and um, absolutely fantastic comments there. OK, over to Alice again. Alice, you're muted at the moment. At the moment. Oh, sorry, still muted. Right, um, back to me. Um, I was just going to say, with that data analysis question, what I liked about your answer, Catherine, is you talk about, you know, the the balance of it, the value of the figures, but then also some critique of it. I think some students will go straight to um, character assassinating the figure, if you like, um, and often the exam board are looking for you to recognize the value in, in those figures as well. Now, case studies, as Catherine said, you've got your examples of particular hazards, but there are two specific case studies we need to know about in some detail. Um, one is a multi-hazardous environment beyond the UK. And here we've given the example of the Philippines. Some uh, people will have studied the Philippines and learned about the fact that this is a country not only affected by tropical storms, um, but also by um, earthquakes and uh, uh, volcanic events. Um, so you may or may not have studied the Philippines. That's not really the point. What do we need to know about it? We need to know about the nature of the hazards in that place, in that environment, um, and the social, economic, and environmental risks presented by those hazards. But we also know, need to know about the human qualities and the responses, such as resilience, adaptation and mitigation, that contribute to its continuing human occupation. So let's put that in English, how and why people still manage to live there, okay? And how, that, how the presence of the hazards actually perhaps uh, affects um, how they live there and then also how they, how they manage that. I believe that's not the only in-depth case study we need. Aha, here's our second one. So the second in-depth case study we need um, is a specified place at a local scale in a hazardous setting. So this is uh, Kobe in Japan. Uh, other people have, have talked about uh, studying the area of, the, of Tohoku in Japan. Um, you might not have done Japan, you've done somewhere else, which is absolutely fine. Uh, but what do we need to know about? We need to know about um, the nature of the hazard clearly kind of what what is it that, that that people are having to react to there and then maybe what the economic social and political character of its community how that has impacted or how it reflects the presence of the hazard um, so that's one to think about also you need to know about the community's response to that risk so there are three elements that we talked about physical nature of the hazard um, the way the character of the community reflects the fact there's that hazard in that environment and then also how the community responds to the risk and perhaps how they prepare for it okay so we've got another uh, quick uh, practice question to have a look at here 
So this is a nine marker and you will have two nine markers for that hazard topic, as we said. Let's have a look at this first one. What is it wanting us to do then? So the command is assess and we need to assess the relative importance of something. What is it we're assessing? Well, we're looking at the primary and secondary impacts of a recent wildfire event. So you need to know clearly what the difference is between the primary and secondary impacts. But what I would say in terms of exam technique is you're not looking for an introductory paragraph here. You don't have time for that with these nine mark questions. They're like a sort of essay in miniature, but skip the introduction. You need to go straight into thinking about the importance of primary uh, impacts, you know, the direct impacts uh, of the hazard compared to those that are the knock-on impacts, perhaps affecting people in the months and years that follow, um, particularly in terms of this recent wildfire event. Um, so some people will have studied uh, wildfire in Fort McMurray in Canada, uh, but it doesn't matter which one you've done. You just need to know that sort of level of detail in terms of primary and secondary. And think about this word importance, importance in terms of the uh, impact on people, perhaps the impact on the environment. So you could perhaps unpack that a little bit as you answer that question. Okay, um, Catherine, do you want to take us through this little bit of exam yeah. gold? Absolutely. So when you're thinking about scales um, and when you're thinking about times, that's really important. And that's been coming up in the comments box here. And um, you have been absolutely fabulous. Somebody was saying, could they just check what was being meant? And there's been lots of people jumping in explaining. So you are an absolute fabulous bunch. Thank you. So when you're thinking about any geography topic, whether it's physical or human, whether we're thinking about hazards, coasts, water and carbon, think about temporal and spatial impact of events. So temporal is how they will differ over time. And then spatial is thinking about the impact at different scales. When we're talking about local scale, we're talking about a relatively small area. So for example, you might have a forest fire which might affect a town. So, so there was, um, you know, in California, you might have, there was a town called Paradise that got very badly affected. And so you might think about that impact on local scale, but then think about a large scale and national scale. There's been a lot of pressure put on politicians in the USA about how are you dealing with the wildfires? Um, what are your policies? And so that could affect things on a national level. But then what about the global impact of something like a wildfire? Think about all that um, carbon that's being released from that carbon store and going up into the atmosphere. So think about impacts at different scales and think about over time, a major hazard event is going to have immediate responses. It's going to need long term responses as well, as well as operating at different scales. So when you're looking at um, when you're looking at this, then keep thinking about this idea of temporal time and spatial thinking about um, different scales. OK, and because we've had a bit of a, a rapid run through these two topics, we just wanted to share um, a few more uh, resources for you. If you, we need some, some additional help on, for example, revising coasts, we've got two uh, revision blasts which take you through, I guess, the uh, lots of games relating to the whole topic over two revision blasts. And you've got the title there. We've also got a QR code and that takes you to a multi-choice quiz. So you could always take a, a picture of that or have a snap that with your phone now and have a go at the multi-choice quiz on coasts. However, if you need a bit more help on the hazards topic, we've got two uh, what we call study live stream, which are kind of a combination of the games and some practice questions. Um, so there's one on hazards, hazard perception and human responses. So going back to those some of those models we talked about. And there's also a, a, a study live stream all about fires in nature and risk management. So that could be a really good one for you if you're feeling a bit un, uncertain about the wildfires topic. And then the QR code actually takes us to a set of notes all about hazards and specifically hazards uh, as uh, studied for AQA A-level. Wow. 
Uh, brilliant stuff. Brilliant stuff, as always. Just reading some of the uh, comments in the chat window there. Thanks to everybody who took part in answering the questions as we went through that tonight. Lots and lots of really good stuff there, I thought. Uh, thank you to Catherine. Thank you to Alice, obviously, for putting that together and going through that tonight. So much good stuff there. It would be a crime not to download the, the uh, PowerPoint, I think. So do have a look out for that. That will be coming along very soon, as soon as we've finished uh, this live. Stream. If you found tonight useful, it'd be great if you could give us a thumbs up on YouTube. That just allows us to get our message out there a little bit more. Uh, and if you have enjoyed tonight, we're back on again next week. Uh, Alice, we're on a, we've got a couple more sessions next week. Is that correct? We've got a couple of sessions, but they're not until so they're on the human paper. So we, okay. what we thought was let people do the physical paper next week. And then our first human uh, revision session is going to be on Thursday, the 25th of May at 6.30. So same time, same day as today, Thursday, but in a couple of weeks' time. In a couple of weeks' time. So on that basis, we won't see everybody until a couple of weeks' time. Between now and then, there is a very important exam coming up. So uh, we would wish everybody the best of luck with that. And we'll see you all again in a couple of weeks' time. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Good luck. Good luck.